thing in America. What were once good jobs are now poverty jobs. And this really happened because during the 1980s, the airlines and the airports began outsourcing all of their work. So responsibility for services that are really critical to the safe and efficient operation of our airports are now in the hands of numerous, dozens, sometimes hundreds, private contractors who pay well wages and offer few benefits and provide employees with inadequate training compared to when these jobs were performed in-house. And when you walk through an airport, I want you to kind of picture when you pass the customer service representative, when you see the sky caps loading luggage onto their cart, when you see a wheelchair worker pushing someone who needs assistance to the gate, when your baggage gets taken to the plane, the cleaner in the terminal, the security officers who are guarding the outside of the airport, the inside doors, the people who are checking your ID before you get into the TSA line, all of those jobs are outsourced, pretty much to the job. And that's just before you get onto the planes. Um, and so SEIU has started a campaign really across the country to organize airport workers and to raise standards. And in 32BJ, we have eight active airports right now uh, in Boston, New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, DC, and Florida. And so today, we're gonna talk about our New York and New Jersey airport campaign. Um, but what I really wanna get across is that this is not an issue that happened with one contractor at one airport. This is a systemic, pervasive issue, both in health and safety, and in a number of other working conditions that is happening across all of our airports. So I wanted to give a little bit of background on the airports in the New York and New Jersey area. In New York City, in the region, and that's really three airports, it's Newark, JFK, and LaGuardia. Um, there are three airports that are controlled by a bi-state agency called the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. And these three airports are huge economic drivers of regional activity. So they create hundreds of thousands of jobs, both in the airports and supported by the airports. And in 2015 alone, the airports uh, generated $80 billion in regional activity. And in addition to the airports, the airlines are reaping profits. So airlines tripled their earnings from $7.5 billion in 2014 to $25.6 billion in 2015. This is a rich industry, and these are rich, important airports. But the workers, as we said, have really been left behind. And here is a quote uh, by one of the cabin cleaners at Newark Liberty Airport. They said, I am homeless. Several, several other employees who work at Newark Liberty Airport live in the same shelter where I live. And this is something that we've really seen across all of our airport campaigns. In DC, just before Thanksgiving, we actually did a sleep in at DC airport because workers there have to work multiple jobs. Some of them don't have places to go home to, or they actually cannot get back to their home in the short amount of time between their shifts. Um, so, Housing insecurity, food insecurity, these are real issues at our airports. And as we mentioned, this is really because of the industry dynamics and the challenges. There's outsourcing. It goes to the lowest bid model. Essentially what happens, an airline needs someone to do their wheelchair work. They hire a contractor, or maybe a couple airlines hire their contractors through somebody who operates the terminal. 
And they can be flipped to another contractor in a matter of days. So we see incredible turnover among the contractors. We see kind of shifts in um, who is doing the work all the time. And workers really have no security. So sometimes the workers follow the contractors from one contractor to the other, and sometimes they're just out of a job. So when we looked at this campaign and when we look at this system, what we said is we need to figure out a systemic solution to this problem. Because if we organize a contractor at the airport, if we organize a wheelchair contractor and raise the rates for one contractor, then the airline is just going to fire that contractor and bring in another contractor that's going to pay their workers less money. And so we have a strategy that both focuses on organizing the employers, the contractors that do these services in the airport, um, and organizing the Port Authority to set a wage and benefit standard for workers. And when we talk about health and safety, we want to we want to make sure it gets across that training, while important, is not going to fix the problem. Because the turnover rate can be incredibly high in the airport. And what you need is you need a system that makes these good jobs, reduces turnover, and keeps people that are well trained. So when we look at Newark, LaGuardia, and JFK, there are over 30,000 workers employed by more than 60 different contractors. And we've been focusing really on 15,000 of this universe. And as I said, these men and women are responsible for crucial services like cabin cleaning, which are the individuals actually clean the planes, wheelchair assistance, baggage handling, cleaning, et cetera, for the millions of passengers that fly in and out of New York. Now we want to talk a little about how on this campaign, taking action around health and safety issues led to an organizing win. And because this is the Labor Research Action Network, we really want to talk about uh, how, as researchers, you can contribute to these campaigns. When you think about health and safety, this is something that the workers really care about. These jobs are bad jobs, not just because they're low paid and they don't have benefits. They're also bad jobs because they are unsafe jobs. And there are regulations around health and safety um, that pertain to the airport. And when we went into this campaign, we knew that health and safety was a prevalent issue in other airports because we had both some experience through campaigns on the West Coast, and two, done research on past issues to identify what might be uh, issues for a particular classification. And when we thought about this and we started talking to the workers, and it's really important to make sure that you are coordinated with the field. This is a worker-driven campaign, um, and I'm actually hoping that we have one of our leaders here today, and he's in another meeting, but that he'll come and kind of share his experience throughout this campaign with all of you. Um, but that it's not just identifying issues and filing a claim with, let's say, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. That what you really need to do is build a full campaign around these issues to engage not just the regulators, but the general public. So I'm actually going to turn it over to Aldo right now, and he's going to talk about how during 2014 we started to build this health and safety critique, and also about the work we did with NICOSH to put together a, a report to really amplify what these issues are. So Aldo? Thanks, Melissa. Can, can people hear me? We can hear you. Great. Um, so as Melissa already mentioned, uh, we already knew um, that workplace health and safety hazards were pervasive in the industry. 
and that most contracts are really not complying with health and safety or OSHA regulations. Um, so between July and August of 2014, a team of 32 BJ researchers undertook a project of surveying airport workers about the hazards they face at work and how employers were addressing them and in most cases how they were not doing it. So that really gave us a good sense of what the, how widespread these issues were at the New York City airports. So we had a good sense of what issues were there specifically. So with workers increasingly motivated to take strong action uh, to improve their jobs specifically around these issues, uh, we decided to approach NICOSH uh, about writing and releasing a report to essentially formalize and provide expert validation of our findings um, and highlight how these uh, failings, I guess, at a local level in the New York City airport. Um, so the COSH network, if people don't know it, is a federation of local and state COSH groups, and COSH stands for Community or Coalitions of Occupational Safety and Health. And these are usually membership organizations uh, of workers, unions, community-based uh, organizations, and health and safety professionals whose mission is to improve health and safety in workplaces through either training, education, or advocacy. And they're really great partners to work uh, with on these issues of health and safety. So uh, we initially had a few meetings with NICOSH, um, and then between August and September in 2014, NICOSH staff uh, came to the airport and actually spent a the whole day there interviewing workers. And then we had other sessions where we brought some workers to the NICOSH office in Manhattan to do additional interviews. And these issues were, these, I'm sorry, these interviews were really long and, um, and they were pretty far from where workers lived or worked. So you really needed workers who were very uh, bought into the process and really committed to the, I guess, to the fight. Um, so uh, Melissa, please move on to the next slide. So after NICOSH did their interviews and their research, um, in early 2014, they finalized the report and they, uh, they published it. So they essentially sent out a press release and sent it to the media outlets that had been covering our campaign. So in general, the main findings of the report were that, the, as Melissa mentioned before, that unsafe working conditions were pervasive in the contracted out ground operations at the airports, um, and that these conditions uh, had known remedies and were preventable. Uh, but also more importantly, that these conditions put the passenger service workers at a necessary risk of injury or death, and that they may even put passengers and travelers at risk, um, and that in most cases, uh, these conditions were violating OSHA and health and safety standards. Uh, so more specifically, the failings that they found, and this is not a comprehensive list, but I'll just mention the highlights from the report. Uh, so, for instance, that wheelchair attendants uh, did not receive the materials to properly disinfect wheelchairs after passengers defecated or urinated or bled on those wheelchairs. Um, another finding was that workers did not receive the adequate training on how to keep themselves safe at work, including wheelchair workers not getting trained on how to, um, I guess, keep their, I guess, protect themselves when passengers get sick on the wheelchairs, or also cabin cleaners not being trained on the safe use of the chemicals that they uh, were using. Um, in addition, they found that cleaners using strong chemicals um, had unlabeled bottles and that they were not provided personal protective equipment like good, like, uh, good gloves or masks to protect themselves. Um, in addition, they found that workers like cabin and terminal cleaners and wheelchair attendants were uh, frequently exposed to blood and bodily fluids and that they were not provided the training on how to protect themselves from the infectious diseases that these uh, substances may carry. Um, they, were also, they also found that some workers were being transported in safe vehicles, sometimes with no seats or no seat belts or with large openings, or even in lift trucks that had inadequate or no railings to prevent falls. Um, and finally, um, as I mentioned before, that these uh, health and safety, um, I guess, uh, hazards may also have an effect on passengers. They also found that um, some workers reported, some terminal cleaners reported that they had to use the same towels to clean toilets, floors, and sinks and faucets because they were frequently not provided enough of them. So in general, the recommendations that they issued were that uh, to reduce the risk that uh, faced by passenger service workers and other passengers and other users of the airport, uh, they recommended that employers should properly identify workplace hazards that they provide training and personal protective equipment to those workers and also make other changes to their operations to 
uh, help eliminate or reduce these hazards. And even though their recommendations mostly focused on employers, they also did recognize the very important role that airlines and the airport authority had also in maintaining the safer workplaces. So I'll pass it back to Melissa. Great. So, you know, as we're doing this work with NICOSH and um, as we're uncovering these huge health and safety issues, at the same time, the Ebola outbreak hit the U.S. And as Aldo said, you're dealing with bodily fluids and other practices that could either spread or prevent diseases. And if you can remember back to this time, there was a real fear in the United States around Ebola coming here. And we had had the first outbreaks of Ebola in the United States. And workers were freaked out. I mean, as you can imagine, people deal with not just urination or other issues on the wheelchairs or in the bathrooms, but also things like needle prick, uh, workers, cabin cleaners specifically, are um, cleaning in the seat pockets, on the chairs, sometimes we'll find needles, we've had needle sticks. And there was like a real fear among the workers because there were known best practices on how to clean these planes and they knew that they weren't given any training or any adequate training or proper equipment to deal with it. And so, you know, when this issue came up, we were not trying to fear monger around it. It's that this is actually a real issue and it is a, um, it is a critical service that the airport workers perform to make sure that our planes are clean and cabin cleaners Sometimes they're given 15 minutes to clean a plane. That's what's called a quick turn. So a plane comes in, they're given 15 minutes to go through, clean the plane, and then also do a security check. And oftentimes they're asked to do this in the dark. So they are doing all this with the flashlight on their cell phone. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that we were able to tie the health and safety concerns of the workers to the health and safety concerns of passengers in the event of an outbreak around Ebola or any other infectious disease. Even things like the winter flu um, can spread rapidly when you're in a contained box. So in October, we sent out essentially uh, a release of the report, and LaGuardia Cabin Cleaners filed a complaint with the Occupational Safety and Health Administration outlining some of their concerns at the job. And we did an announcement that we were gonna have an infectious disease awareness training. And what this was, was that the um, SEIU Health and Education Fund and the SEIU 1199 Doctors Council provided a training on how to supplement whatever current training the workers were receiving um, on how to better protect themselves and other people. And so as we announced this um, and the workers were um, taking more and more action, they decided to go on strike. So on October 8th, 200 cabin cleaners decided to go on strike to protest unsafe working conditions along with unfair labor practices. And that morning, the first U.S. Ebola victims died. So um, it happened to be that the workers had already planned. They had voted to strike previously. They had planned to take action. And it happened at the same time as the first Ebola victim died. And that really caused national attention on this strike. And one of the workers, uh, one of our cabin cleaners said, you know, we have to deal with vomit. We get insufficient materials to work, like gloves that break. We deal with strong chemicals and waste that can cause damage. As workers, we deserve better treatment and quality of life. 
So the next day, the workers were still on strike, and we brought everybody together and did this infectious disease preparedness training. So workers came together. You can see from the pictures, people learned kind of how to put on gloves so that you would protect yourself and also take off the gloves so that you weren't spreading disease. Um, and we've actually done this training many, many times, this and other health and safety trainings at uh, other airports um, and for other groups of workers. And the tension from this strike, I mean, I've worked for the union for uh, nearly 20 years, and I can say there are very few instances where anything has been picked up like these health and safety issues. So as you can see from some of the headlines, we got picked up by national news. We were on pretty much every every local and national news story that you can imagine had video and talk um, interviews with the workers. And on Fox News, we actually got hashtag Ebola strike as, <laughs> as a tagline for this. And I think the reason that this got picked up, obviously there was a national crisis, but we were really able to link the concerns of those working with a larger public safety and health me message. And that's what got national attention. And we also, you know, the CDC was saying that there are guidelines around how airports are going to deal with Ebola. Um, they were trying to assure the public and essentially we're saying like nobody's following the guidelines. And so we also got calls from every level of government, um, including the White House around this strike. I want to just say that um, these issues can be similar uh, in other worker issues in the airport. So two other places or three other places we've been looking are uh, emergency response, essentially what happens when a crisis like a terrorist attack or an active shooting happens at the airport and what's the role that workers play. Security, since workers do security functions both in the planes and outside of the planes as well as um, wheelchair work with disabled passengers. So what happened from this? One, the company settled. This strike uh, really put a ton of pressure on the company and they recognized the workers. And this is actually um, our first contractor that signed at the New York, New Jersey airport that was not uh, contracted just by the Port Authority. So it was the first airline contracted unit we had trainings across a number of airports in the country, and the USGAO, which is the Government Accountability Office uh, for the federal government, actually did an entire investigation around air travel and communicable diseases, and they said uh, employees at aviation services firms that GAO spoke with including contract workers who clean aircraft, raise concerns about the availability of training and access to equipment to control exposure to communicable diseases. And they put in a number of recommendations on best practices for a system that would improve how our airlines operate. Since then, health and safety has been a continued priority for the airport campaign. Um, and at the end, I'm actually going to turn it over to talk about some how that plays out in some of our current campaigns. But just so you understand, in LA, there actually was a terrible accident where Cesar Valenzuela um, had a fatal accident, and his contractor tried to hide it and say that he had a heart attack and was at fault, when really he got thrown from a, a van that didn't have a seatbelt. Um, in uh, Seattle, con contractors have been cited for failing to maintain safe workplaces. In Newark, we've had a number of activities around a contractor who has had issues with needle stick and other issues, and in Boston as well. So it's really becoming a major issue for our campaign to expose these worker issues, but also to take action around them. So where are we now? 
Right now in New York and New Jersey, we have 7,000 airport workers. They're actually in bargaining today, and we're hoping that they win their first contract. So to go from two years ago, 200 workers to 7,000 is pretty incredible. And that is really because of the dedication of these workers to fight for what they deserve. Um, we are organizing another 7,000. The wages in New York airports are rising to $15 as a result of a minimum wage campaign that airport workers played a crucial role in. Um, but what, and there's still 1010 in New Jersey. So when we started the campaign, they were minimum wage jobs. And through the campaign, we had risen it to 1010 and then one for minimum wage of 15 in New York. So this is still a tremendous fight for us because even at $15 in New York and 1010 in New Jersey, there's no benefits and the jobs are still really minimum wage jobs. So the minimum wage will rise in New York and that's great and that's a great first step and airport workers deserve a lot of credit for taking part in that campaign. But we really need to continue fighting for an enhanced wages and benefits package uh, for everybody that works at the airport. So the fight continues for that. Nationally through the campaign, we've really seen wages and benefits rise across the country. So um, SEAU has been campaigning and has gotten wage and benefits, some of these are combined and some of these are just wages, of 1784 in San Francisco, 1604 in LAX, 1524 at Seattle SeaTac, uh, $11 at Boston, which we believe is going to go up to 12 in the new year, and $12 at Philadelphia, and 13.38 at Fort Lauderdale. And these are all jobs, except for San Francisco and LAX, who have been union for a little bit longer. These are all jobs that four years ago were minimum wage jobs, or maybe $8 an hour jobs. So some of the takeaways are that worker buy-in is really necessary. This is a field campaign. This is about worker issues, and you need to make sure that you are engaging in a real serious way and that you're taking these issues seriously. It's not just a, about filing a report. It's really about how do you build a campaign that pulls many people into these issues. And you need to kind of be on on top of things, especially when you're filing OSHA reports throughout the process. And then lastly, I would say uh, it's really good to have third-party validators like NICOSH, other people who are echoing how serious these issues are um, so that the issues aren't discounted. Now, I wanted to take a, just a couple minutes to turn it over to May and Nate, who continue to work on the New York and New Jersey campaign and can talk about how that campaign is still building around health and safety issues. Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nate. Uh, as Melissa said, I'm a researcher on our airports campaign. Uh, and I've been doing uh, work in particular at, at two of our airports here in the New York City area around health and safety uh, for about, I'd say, the last year. Um, so again, as, as Melissa mentioned, uh, a lot of the issues that We've uncovered at one airport health and safety issues uh, we find at every other airport that we show up at. Um, so we had a situation uh, in New York and New Jersey where a contractor who provides services uh, to airlines across the three airports uh, who we're currently uh, organizing and, and in a fight with, um, the workers had reported to us a number of, of shared issues uh, across a couple of the airports. For wheelchair workers, those issues included um, some ergonomic issues that, that the wheelchairs uh, had bad wheels and brakes that, you know, through pushing passengers and pulling their baggage along were causing uh, repetitive stress injuries. We had uh, cabin cleaners as well as wheelchair workers report to us that they were continuously exposed to, to blood uh, and other potentially infectious materials, other bodily fluids, either through, as Melissa mentioned, uh, you know, discovering needles in seatback pockets, uh, running across blood, 
uh, or other bodily fluids while cleaning uh, bathrooms and the rest of the airplanes and terminal areas uh, and the like. So, um, oh, and then finally, I should mention uh, a lot of the cabin cleaners that uh, for this company uh, at the different New York City airports reported being uh, transported between uh, the planes that they were cleaning and the terminals in vans uh, with non-functioning doors, uh, doors that would get that would get locked that they couldn't get out of or that would open uh, while the vans were in motion, uh, vans without seat belts, with bed bugs, uh, without power steering, uh, and a whole host of other issues. Uh, so these were health and safety issues that workers were agitated on uh, before we even showed up. Um, so we sort of seized on that momentum uh, and decided to file OSHA complaints at two airports uh, around the issues I mentioned uh, for the same company uh, operating at at, uh, at both airports. Um, you know, it, as Melissa mentioned, it's not it's sort of not just about filing a complaint. Um, you know, once you file the complaint, uh, it's important to have workers, just as far as the regulatory process itself is concerned, uh, involved at every step. So we, uh, you know, myself as the researcher, I made sure. Uh, to stay in constant contact with the workers about updates to their situation, uh, whether the issues were still present, how things were changing, uh, and relayed that information uh, to the OSHA inspectors who were out at the airport doing their own work as well. We made sure uh, to continually push the inspectors to meet with our workers off, uh, off site uh, so that they could be free from intimidation, free from feeling like their boss was breathing down their neck, uh, and that's, that's so that we can ensure that the OSHA inspectors were hearing the same thing uh, from workers that, that the workers were telling us. Um, so throughout the process, we continued to put workers before the OSHA inspectors uh, and eventually uh, got a, a number of citations. The company, I think OSHA cited the company at the two different airports for somewhere around uh, 15 uh, different violations of OSHA law and regulations. Uh, and find the company $60,000, I believe it was, uh, roughly, uh, at the two airports. So for people that are unfamiliar with OSHA, uh, it's an astronomically high figure. Um, we rarely see anything really uh, above $5,000 um, for different citations at different airports. Um, so in the wake of, of having these OSHA release the citations, we uh, did a delegation to the company. Uh, a bunch of workers from both airports showed up at their corporate office um, in New Jersey uh, with demands that the issues be fixed, that the vans that were faulty be replaced, uh, that the company provide uh, sharp disposal boxes for the workers to dispose of needles in uh, and fix other issues. Uh, and then uh, a, maybe I'd say a couple weeks later, uh, the workers went on a one-day protected strike uh, to highlight some of these issues and to continue to push the company to make improvements. Uh, as it stands now, the, the company is challenging the OSHA, OSHA citations. Um, so there's been a lot of sort of, you know, in these pro the sort of regulatory process can drag out. Uh, and if you're not keeping workers involved, it, it can be, you know, it can demobilize the campaign. So we've made sure to continue to bring workers before OSHA, uh, to continue to testify to their issues, but also to keep workers agitated uh, around these issues on the ground, uh, to delegate to their employer, to ask for improved working condition, conditions and the like. Um, so the, the campaign around health and safety is, is still going on to this day. Great, thanks. So we'll take questions if people have them. Um, let's see, as I'm seeing right now, no one has given any questions yet. Ah. As I repeat it again, in the control panel, there's a small section that says questions. You can just type any questions you have in here. I mean, I see 28 people total are listening. So if you have any questions, just type them in there, and then I can repeat them to uh, so everyone can hear, and especially the presenters. And then we can uh, begin the question and answer time. Um, while we're waiting on that, do you all have anything else you want to add? Uh, Melissa, Aldo, Mike? I think that... Um... I think that uh, when you're looking at kind of worker issues, you want to kind of be able to tie them 
broader, and I know we've talked about some. Other other things we've looked at are um, wage and hour, and so we found uh, incredible violations of wage and hour law. We've gotten uh, fines by the AG of a million dollars. We have some private lawsuits that we think will settle maybe in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And we really kind of tied that to the larger Fight for 15 campaign. Um, also issues of food insecurity. Um, a poll that we did at one time said that one out of five workers have to miss a meal because they don't have enough money to pay for it. So um, kind of taking a pulse of what some of the larger issues are uh, in the country or in your region and connecting it to those broader campaigns is important. Good. We have a couple questions came in. One is from Patrick Dixon. He said, uh, did the fact that the TSA workers are now AFG help you in getting access to the workers at all? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, it's not like TSA workers are un, unsupportive. It's just that, um, you know, either the workers are in front of the security line and you have access to them or they are behind the security line and you do not have access to them unless you're flying somewhere. Okay. All right. One from Steve Lawton. Uh, when you say protected strike, do you mean a ULP strike? Can you explain yes. the process of moving a safety issue to a ULP strike? So the unfair labor practices are really around um, the boss either trying to harass, fire, coerce, um, workers in the event of an organizing campaign. And as we often find, when workers raise issue, the boss violates their right to raise those issues. So it's pretty common um, to find a worker issue along with an unfair labor practice issue. And we work very, very closely with our, we have a large legal department, we work very closely with our legal department to make sure when workers go on strike that we are doing it under a protected activity. Um, and so we're actually, it, it can be tricky, you have to be careful on how you're raising issues um, because you want to make sure that it's not just around an economic or safety issue, but also, you know, workers are trying to bring their issues to the public and also to protect the public around safety concerns that the public might have. Um, and the fact that the that they're getting fired or harassed or retaliated against for doing so, um, unfortunately, is often the case. So. All right. One from Rachel Tyree. Could you walk through the process of filing complaints to OSHA, strategically choosing which violations to focus on when submitting complaints in regards to furthering organizing goals? Talk about that, Mike? Sure. Um, so when looking at issues, we looked at issues that one would be I'm sorry, I feel like she gets closer. One that OSHA directly has a regulation on. So there are so for example, there are provisions within OSHA that say that workers must be protected from bloodborne pathogens. Then there are also other provisions that go under this general duty clause where, you know, the employer has to help workers keep safe. So one instance of, of an issue that would fall under that would be, um, you know, the van issue where Nate had mentioned before that workers are riding around in vans without seat belts um, with doors that lock, right? And so, or like they open up. And so there's no uh, regulation around that specifically, although that's very dangerous. While we chose to cover that issue because this is a really important issue that workers are really concerned about and they were willing to take action on, we also had it, we also had to include bloodborne uh, pathogen concerns that also workers were safety, uh, that workers were concerned about, but tiny other things too that workers weren't aware of, but that we knew that would be, um, you know, a very, uh, like a, a hit, like a home run kind of case. So for example, workers 
who are exposed to blend 4 pathogens have to have hepatitis C shots. Workers didn't really care about the hepatitis C shots. In fact, some of them were wary of their employers giving them any shots at all. But we included that um, you know, complaint in because we knew that workers just did not get it. And so it was like a mix of you know, issues that workers were concerned about and also issues that we knew that uh, OSHA had direct uh, regulations on. Okay, um, let's see. This one's from Eric Dernbach. Um, can you talk more about the airport sleep-in action you mentioned? What did that look like? Yeah, so um, that was in D.C. right before Thanksgiving, and unfortunately nobody on the phone is um, working on the D.C. campaign directly, so we weren't there. But the concerns that have been raised from um, airport workers are, are several. So one, we just have a number of airport workers who actually don't have homes. They don't have a place to sleep. Um, they need to sleep in their car um, or somewhere else and oftentimes sleep in the terminal. Two, in D.C., the um, subways actually stop running fairly early and the airports operate 24 hours a day. And people don't have enough money for transportation outside of a metro card. And so a number of workers were sleeping in the airport because they needed to get to work at a time that the metro didn't run. So they were either coming hours and hours and hours earlier and sleeping until their shift started um, or would be getting off work and were at the airport until the metro started running again. So. We had a number of airport workers, a number of politicians, um, community activists actually do an event at the airport where they slept in the common areas, and we got um, incredible press. And so I think probably if you Googled uh, sleep in DC airport, you'd, you'd call up the news. Okay, okay. And one from another question from Scott Goodell. Can you speak a little more about can you speak a little more about workplace health and safety committees and organizing and any role the union is playing? So I'm not sure if that if we've set up workplace organizing committees per se. We do a lot of health and safety work through our training funds. And so um for instance, a large percentage of our membership are cleaners, and cleaners deal with a lot of chemicals and a lot of issues around chemicals, as long as a lot of ergonomic issues, because you're really moving boxes, uh, bins, et cetera. And so the training fund for the union, which uh, the members are all part of, they have all these programs to develop best practices and train people either as individuals, but more often with the full company um, in the workplace. And they can do those trainings either at our funds or at the workplace themselves. Um, I can't, we may have uh, some workplace uh, health and safety committees somewhere, but I unfortunately just don't know about them. Let's see. Uh, well, right now, there are no more questions. If you have any more questions, um, go ahead and send them, but that was the last one we have at the moment. Um, you can give people another moment or two to try to ask a few, a couple more. Any other uh, maybe salient points you all want to raise that you didn't have not gotten to yet? Maybe just out? to, to um, piggyback off uh, May's response to the earlier question about um, how to sort of strategically file OSHA complaints. I think uh, everything she said is is exactly what you want to do as far as identifying, uh, you know, which issues to really uh, highlight in the complaint. I'd also like to add that that you know, as researchers, we you know we have maybe uh, you know dozens of workers approach us uh, to testify about specific issues. But as far as which workers, we make sure to get before OSHA or other regulatory bodies. We do a really good job um, of 
uh, of talking to the workers beforehand and prepping them, um, you know, in order to go into those interviews that they have. Um, you know, workers oftentimes will identify a whole host of issues, um, and we kind of know off the bat what OSHA is going to, you know, is going to really care about, which issues really touch on OSHA regulations. So we encourage them, of course, to tell their full story, but make sure uh, to also prep them on what kind of things OSHA listens out for listens out for and sort of to kind of give them the language to, to put their their health and safety uh, grievances, uh, you know, in the most digestible form for OSHA. And I, I'd say that's maybe an important process, uh, part of the process as well, is to really make sure uh, to get workers before these regulatory bodies as much as possible, to sort of, you know, make sure that they're involved at every step and to make sure that uh, that they know what the process is going to look like going in so that they can be the most effective voice for their own concerns. Right. And I would also add that another tip on approaching OSHA is that I want to say that most, if not all, regions have a position called the labor liaison. And so in New York and New Jersey regions, we have this great labor liaison who we talk to all throughout the process, like while interviewing workers, filing the OSHA complaints, and you know, after the citations get released. Um, and this person has been really helpful in that, you know, a lot of times, you know, OSHA's really slammed with investigations, and sometimes inspectors are uh, slow, can can be slow to respond because they just have a lot of work to deal with, and so. A labor liaison would be helpful in terms of helping uh, you guide through, you know, what's the best way to communicate with inspectors um, and, you know, how to follow up on them properly. And they also um, will keep tabs on the case so that in case anything significant pops up that you're also aware of the issues as well. So, you know, one of the things that we dealt with was that because we are not the official representatives of a lot of these workers. We're not like the typical, not like the representing union of these workers. OSHA sometimes, if they don't have deal with uh, you know workers who are in organizing campaigns, don't really know how to respond to a union's presence when they're not the official uh, union. And so a labor liaison will also help guide. Uh, the office, the local office, the inspectors on, you know, what our role is and how we can be of help and use to this investigation as well. And Wes, I just wanted to add, um, I know Aldo talked about Kosh as a resource. Um, Kosh actually has a group that wants to get involved and deal with organizing campaigns. And if people want to, uh, to know a way to get involved, um, you can, uh, I guess you can email me, and also if you have any additional questions, you can email me. I can put you in touch with um, Eric Furman, who is putting together an organizing listserv for the Occupational Safety and Health Advocates of Kosh. Um, let's see, one more, another question from Steve Lawton. He asked, can you explain the job actions the workers took in support of the safety issues? Could they have struck without the ULPs by management? Um, you know, we, you, can, you can always strike. I mean, there are some different circumstances in, in different types of work, uh, like healthcare workers, et cetera, and if you're under contract. But you can strike over non-ULP issues but your protect, you don't have the protection, right? So workers can go on strike over economic issues, um, but there is a potential that they could be replaced. So if we're gonna do a strike, uh, we wanna make sure that workers are protected. There are lots of other activities we do with workers. We do actions all the time. <laughs> we have actions at the airport all the time that aren't strikes that don't have to have that unfair labor practice um, in uh, a week ago, two weeks ago, on November 29th, we did a major action at uh, at Newark, uh, Florida, D.C., and Boston, 
and only one of those was, was a strike. And that was actually around the FIFA 15 and economic justice issues. So um, other people have different experiences. We try to do strikes around ULPs. If we've also done, uh, you know, if if the question is also about like, um, you know, how do what sort of actions workers have taken that are specific to health and safety issues? Hmm. We've had workers who, you know, have requested their OSHA log, uh, you know, 500. Right. 300. 300, sorry, I'm getting the numbers confused. <laughs> um, basically, uh, all employers are required to list down, you know, different injuries that occur in the workplace. And while this seems to be a really simple action, um, workers are really intimidated and so uh, to request these documents. And so we've done a lot of health and safety actions to help uh, encourage workers to take more action in the future so it's more of an like internal organizing thing but you know doing a simple delegation to a manager to request these forms have been powerful uh, doing delegations where workers together sign a petition saying hey we think we know actually we deserve these protective equipment um, can you hand them to us uh, tomorrow and sometimes managers will respond um, Things sometimes we've had, though we've not encouraged them, sometimes workers have also, you know, decided not to work um, a shift because the lights were off of their cabin uh, for that day. So there have been a lot of, you know, different tiny actions that workers have taken, but they have been mostly for, you know, uh, to help internally organize the workers. Yeah, and I don't, I don't know, although if you have any other types of actions you've taken in Florida? No, yeah, I was just going to add that uh, OSHA is not really the, I guess, the, you don't have to go through OSHA if you want to use health and safety issues to organize workers. So the thing that comes to mind is uh, recently, earlier this year, we used health and safety issues as a way to essentially launch our campaign publicly at Miami International Airport, where there were hundreds of workers who had a lot of issues, but the most important one being that they were exposed to very, very dangerous levels of carbon monoxide at the, where they were doing baggage handling. So what they did is they we essentially put together a report that was, you know, similar to a white paper. And then we brought that along with tens of workers to a committee of the county commissioners who oversee the, the airport. And then they demanded uh, strong action from the from this body to fix all these issues at the, I guess, at the places where they were having those problems. Um, and it resulted in really the workers, you know, becoming more active, the workers being emboldened to take stronger action, and eventually they actually went on strike for UOPs. Um, and the, the committee that, I guess, had oversight over at the airport also took the necessary steps to fix the issues at the airport. So usually uh, you can go through these uh, alternative ways to deal with these issues, not really through OSHA. And I guess the advantage of that is you have a lot more freedom on what you can do, and then that the issues can usually become, I guess, get resolved a lot faster than if you go through OSHA. Because OSHA will usually take six months to release their findings or to decide whether to issue citations or not. So that's one of the downsides of OSHA. And while, while the OSHA investigation is happening, it's usually better to, to keep quiet and not really publicize it too much. So you have to weigh on the pros and cons of going through the OSHA process. Okay. All right. I don't see any more questions coming in. So, um, do you all have any final words? Because we're coming up on three o'clock anyway. That's about an hour. Uh, any final words you all want to add, the presenters? I just I thank you everybody for joining. Um, we're really excited about this campaign. Um, we really care about these issues. If you have questions, you can feel free to email me at um, m as in Melissa, a m as in Melissa, e r n as in Nancy, i c k at s e i u 32 bjorg Okay. All right. And to let everyone know as well, uh, we did record this session. So this will be stored in the GoToWebinar that you actually got the invitation from. You can find the recording there. So you can actually go back and listen to it or share it with uh, other people in your unions. 
And so I want to thank the presenters, uh, Melissa, Aldo, and others, and everyone who came in. Looks like we had around 28 people. And like I said, we're going to continue to have these webinars on a quarterly basis. Uh, this is the work of the Projects Committee. Um, if you're interested in being a part of it, um, or LRAN in general more, you can contact me at ben at jwj.org, and I can give you the process of joining, being a part of the Projects Committee or another committee or LRAN. Uh, so I want to thank everybody and, of course, thank the presenters. And we'll talk to you Great. soon. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone.